All right, well, welcome back. Thank you for coming. Don't be shy, come in the front. We are fewer people. Uh, I should have mentioned earlier, but this session is also um, visible online. So for those who stayed with us uh, online, uh, thank you. We are now going to, well, we keep preparing for the future. Uh, and this particular session will look at unforeseen shocks uh, in health. I think the, the world has been pretty shaken up by COVID and uh, it is probably a good time, a good opportunity to look at the lessons learned, the immediate consequences from COVID, but also to be able to, to move out from this crisis mode and prepare for uh, what's next. And I think we don't need to be foresight experts to, um, to anticipate that there might well be future pandemics, unfortunately. So to discuss uh, what can be done and what could be the sustainable solutions uh, to for unforeseen shocks, uh, I'm in very good company. A men-only panel, so I am the diversity, obviously. Uh, and though I, I'll introduce you, uh, you the, the four of you. So Ole Peter Otterson, you're the president of the Karolinska Institute. Next to you, Thomas Hasser, who is the president of Tartu. University. Next to you, Jean-Marc Bourges, who is the Chief Executive Officer of EIT Health. And finally, David Elvira, who is the Head of Global Corporate Affairs, right at Sanofi. Gentlemen, welcome. So let's kick off. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm really conscious that a lot can go wrong with these discussions, and we don't want to be too pessimistic, okay? So to get one thing out of the way, um, what should we learn from COVID? What is an immediate lesson that we should take stock of right now to be able to move on? Pick one. There are many, but pick one just to get the discussion started. Who wants to start? Oli Peter, go ahead. Okay, since I'm closest to you, perhaps I should start. Um, first of all, it's a very important topic that we are discussing now, and particularly the university's role in, in, in this particular um, uh, challenge that we are discussing. First of all, I think the most important thing we have learned from the pandemic is that uh, solidarity, solidarity does not suffice. It's not sufficient to uh, think that uh, we as a world can distribute medicines, vaccines when a crisis hits. We have to think in a much longer term perspective. So I think this is also incumbent on the universities to uh, participate in building preparedness for, for health, not only respond to, to uh, health uh, threats, as is in the title of this uh, session, but to build universal preparedness for health. That is the most important lesson, I think, we have after this uh, pandemic. And this means that we have to build, for example, production capacities for vaccines, also in low and middle income settings. Very good, universal preparedness. Juan. Yeah, I mean, uh, um, I would say that uh, we have been able to uh, uh, both uh, prepare us ourselves to, uh, 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 let's say, reshape the ground regarding the, uh, the way to uh, transfer or to translate uh, res basic research to, uh, uh, to the market uh, from, uh, from innovation so far. And uh, being ab able as well uh, in, in the war uh, uh, mode uh, to uh, uh, demonstrate our solidarity uh, uh, across the member states. And one of the most, most important things uh, was about the uh, capability of Europe to, uh, um, from a public procurement perspective, uh, to manage a, a kind of risk-sharing approach to buy uh, promising drugs, uh, treatments, vaccines, and medical technologies uh, that uh, has been, uh, let's say, delivered to the patients and the healthcare system so far. So I would say both uh, war mode, uh, capability and ability to tackle the, uh, the, the crisis so far, and preparing the ground uh, to lessons learned and preparing our future so far. Very good. Just from a uh, university perspective, I think the, uh, the, the main message was the, uh, we have been showing the, uh, what's the importance of research. We may say also whether it's a frontline or whatever, but the importance of the basic research and specifically a long run, so it's not just a one single 
uh, discovery, but the, the whole range continuing was 20 years or more. So that is the, the most, probably the most important thing so we, we have learned. But there is, of course, there are, because being a, myself was also the clinician, so there are many, many components. If we go down to the clinical side, uh, and also what we have learned in our country in Estonia so is the importance not only just the the vaccines but also the role of the uh, social sciences and that's really something new and I think, I think that it gives us uh, something for to be prepared in the future in the coming whether it's a catastrophe or or whatever it will be <laughs> so it's really important very good david um, thank you. I will echo part of the of the of the assessment and the analysis. I think the first message is that we learn, uh, and it's uh, once in a generation or even a century. How how connected is health healthcare delivery and economy, and and business? So and um, how when we protect the health, we protect also the economic um, you know uh, ecosystem of a country. And then we are, when we are dealing with, uh, and this is more from the perspective of um, a more business perspective, but when we protect also our uh, economy is because uh, COVID-19 crisis also highlight the need to put health as a security asset of countries. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the uh, takeaways that I think in this kind of ecosystem from discovery to manufacturing and supply of uh, treatments, uh, it's a kind of takeaway of this crisis. Uh, here, I just want to highlight as a takeaway this need of collaboration, and, uh, and you mentioned that from the discovery to the supply, to the access. Uh, also, uh, uh, Professor Ottersen highlighted that. It's not only that we discover solutions to tackle the crisis, we have to be well prepared from an end to end approach. So, our manufacturing should be prepared, our supply should be prepared, our access conditions should be prepared. Our incentives as well should be prepared in terms of, for example, how we anticipate purchasing capacities to the access of, of, uh, of, uh, of the uh, solutions of, of a crisis. Let me just highlight this idea that one of the lessons learned of the COVID crisis is the need of strengthening the collaboration in the private and public sector, mm -hmm. anticipation, and let me just put as a, as a kind of uh, initial thought, the need of a sustainable long-term investment in the end-to-end -end ecosystem from science to business. Very good. Well, that's an entire chain, so this will have to come back to it, as well as um, to the, the public-private collaboration. I think this is one of the, of the key topics of discussion. One thing that COVID has uh, put really the spotlight on is the, um, the role of science. And at some point, it's all the citizens who were looking forward to a scientific solution to this crisis, right? And looking for, uh, for a vaccine or a treatment, right? So uh, one takeaway, I think we will all agree that it's, uh, it's the importance of breakthrough science. Mm. Uh, and indeed, it was raised by Maria Leptin and by Roberti and Smith earlier in earlier panels. So, I just want to ask this question. Do you think Europe is sufficiently equipped uh, to bring, uh, to scale up the breakthrough science and to take it up to the next level and to transform it into innovation? John Arquest. Yeah, let's make clear that uh, when it comes to uh, the way that uh, uh, Europe has been able to uh, tackle this uh, uh, pandemic uh, is uh, mainly uh, related to the uh, excellence of science. Many uh, vaccines are coming from uh, European countries' uh, labs. I mean, all the major three or four vaccines are coming from French, uh, German, uh, Italy, Nordics, and, and the UK uh, research and academic uh, organizations so far. Four out of the six vaccines that has been developed so far. So science is really robust. It, there is no debate on that. The key question is about uh, the, yeah, the, the scale up, the, next the bit. scale up, indeed. Yes. And uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, when it comes to the scale up, it's, it's about uh, investment, not only public but also private investment, mm -hmm. and um, that that means a lot. I mean, uh, uh, you know, when it comes to the the major vaccines that has been developed so far during the pandemic crisis, uh, many private investors uh, make uh, it happen uh, since they were coming from US, 
uh, many large corporate uh, industry were able to invest a lot into promising vaccines and new drugs uh, uh, so far. So, I mean, uh, no debate science is really robust uh, to scale up. And the key question is about our capability and ability to uh, uh, reinforce uh, the uh, private investment across Europe uh, to support public uh, research organizations, translations toward the market. All right, yeah, and the Pfizer and Moderna, as of this world, aren't European. Hold on, before I give the, the, the floor to you, Sanofi was in this tough race uh, to yes, find a vaccine. Exactly. Uh, Didn't go through. What uh, happened? Yeah, um, well, we are quite proud that we are offering kind of uh, um, uh, more options on the vaccinations uh, with uh, different platforms than, than others. And so I, I think it was an achievement. But just to reinforce part of the ideas, yeah, European science is in good shape. Maybe what is something lagging behind is how we transform science in innovation itself. So I have some, some just uh, some data on the COVID-19 uh, uh, investment on clinical uh, on clinical research, U.S. invested 13 billion only for the COVID-19, okay? While EU did not fund clinical development plans. So if we have the big picture of how we are providing research and investing in research in, develop, in the role, competitive role, <laughs> in the global sphere, uh, we decreased 10 points from 31% to, for, uh, to uh, um, um, 10, so we represent now 31% of the overall investment in research. If we compare with the 41, sorry about the, uh, the figures, uh, if we compare 20 years ago. So something is happening in the transition from science to innovation. And maybe here one of the lessons to learn is how I insist in this idea of sustainable so, uh, uh, investment. So when uh, uh, we had decades in US investing in bodies like BARDA, then we can have more targeted, orientated investments for this transition. Because in the end, when we need a collaboration between public and private sector and be ready for the next pandemic, we need trust. We need to be prepared for this response. So uh, I think uh, we are on track, we have here, but it's only the beginning. We need more this end-to-end -end approach. So we have to be ready for the investment, not only in the science, that is in Gotche, but in the science translated into innovation. But David, is, are there, uh, so just, we're, we're just a small group uh, on, on the record. Um, <laughs> What's, are those the main challenges that Sanofi faced uh, in this space to, to find a vaccine? What, what went wrong? Well, it, it's, I, I don't consider that was wrong because, uh, you know, uh, science has the path. You have your speeds and you have your needs. You have your, uh, also your approach in what is, uh, could be the... But some, some takeaways. Yes. Maybe what about being more flexible in terms of uh, regulatory approach? What about uh, being more confident in global sharing uh, data that can help on the flexibility of regulation. All what right. about more flexibility in the way we can advance in the manufacturing solutions with well-defined well, uh, and designed advanced procurement systems that can share the, uh, the, the, the risk? What is quite relevant uh, as a takeaway, I think, in all the experience, not for Sanofi, yeah, but no, I but think for, very for everyone. Yeah, it's yeah. To, uh, all the stakeholders have to do their job and they have to have the resources to do that. Uh, in high risk discovery should be funded by uh, public uh, um, funded uh, uh, basic research and science because this is the, the real public good. You but agree? Uh, just on the university side, do you agree with this statement? The role of basic science and, uh, and the need to finance it. I think I will come back on to the that. public side. Yeah. Another, but if, if, if we have very robust public good, that is knowledge, we need uh, other players like the industry to translate into uh, real innovation. That requires also uh, to protect some assets like uh, I, uh, intellectual property, for example. So all the debate, this is also kind of learning of this crisis, uh, 
when we are thinking about incentives of all these stakeholders and how we protect IP, IP, for example, intellectual property, was one of the drivers in order to accelerate in 10 months what normally the industry needs 10 years. It was an enabler and not a kind of stopper of the innovation. So in the future, we have to be well prepared that any global governance on how to deal with uh, uh, this kind of pandemics or crisis uh, protect what is the asset for each of the stakeholders. Good. We'll come back to the question of IP and global governance. But before we do that, gentlemen. Well, a keyword. Uh, in this discussion should be inequities. I mean, we cannot have this discussion without having the global perspective and look at what happened during the pandemic where the uh, inequities in health were not only revealed but deepened during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have to think about uh, what uh, we all knew at the outset of this pandemic, that Africa, for example, has to import 98% of its, its vaccines. I mean, this is certainly not sustainable. And I think, uh, look, going back to uh, private-public uh, partnership, um, we had a meeting at Karolinska Institute in November where we introduced the concept Life Science 2.0, which means that we have to look at the entire life science sector, industry, um, of course, universities, uh, um, NGOs even, but uh, also um, uh, authorities, to see whether we can, in fact, prepare for the next crisis by uh, reducing the te technology gap that we see in the world today. And that is very, very evident when it comes to the production facilities, or lack thereof, for vaccines and, and medicines. And in fact, uh, what must be done, I think, is to apply what you say, the entire value chain uh, way of thinking, to ensure that uh, we, next time around, when a new crisis hit, that we have the possibility to produce medicines, vaccines, also outside of Europe and North America and, and mm -hmm. India, in low and middle income uh, settings. And pharmaceutical industry, universities have to collaborate on that. Yep. And I'm very happy to, to, to uh, announce that uh, your company, in fact, is now supporting Mm -hmm. uh, over university to uh, try to establish the entire value chain in, uh, in sub-Saharan Africa to provide for vaccine and medicine production because it's not an easy thing. No. You need system thinking. You need to start with, obviously, with education. Uh, you, you have to go through, of course, production, fill and finish. Um, but also we need a market pool. And finally, you need to tackle the very difficult obstacle, which is called uh, vaccine hesitancy. And all Absolutely. of this requires system thinking and uh, a life science sector that is reframed, not only for caring for a crisis here and now, but to build preparedness for the next crisis. This is what you call life science 2.0. Early Peter, just one question uh, on this cooperation. It's actually very interesting that you say that it's in sub-Saharan Africa, yeah. right? Yeah. So what, what does it focus on? Yeah, it's, you say the entire chain, but what's the starting point? Is it, is it going up to the manufacturing Well, facility? the project that we're talking about now where Sanofi generously provides support is uh, setting up uh, clinical trial capacity. All right. It's also okay. here in Africa, which is absolutely needed. It's part of the value chain. If I, if I may just jump one sentence, because we focus, for example, on the debate of pandemic response about production. Production was not the issue. Mm. It was access to the production, potentially. And in this kind of also collaboration, we need to reinforce the healthcare systems. So because sometimes it's the supply, the knowledge, the capabilities where we have to invest first in order to, uh, to, to have this capacity. And we have some tools, global tools, even in the TRIPS, that uh, uh, allow this kind of transfer of technology. But to transfer technology, we need capabilities and capacities. Exactly. And I think this is the first kind of hurdle that we have to tackle, because if not, we are discussing about, again, protection of intellectual property when the, when the issue is it's, it's not there. We are diverging from the real, real nest, need on the ground that is the capacity to absorb the innovation and the technology. Mas. Uh, yes, uh, from, uh, from our point of view, so because Estonia has been, well, 
more than 20 years already very active in implementing different type of e-services in society. And when the COVID started, so we were thinking just, uh, of course, we've got many, many positive things out of those different uh, applications on the, on the state level. But from the very beginning, we saw how we are actually unable to, uh, to produce the proper data and how actually we're dealing with the data. And, and so there are many, many aspects to, to work with, uh, with the data. So, and uh, as a clinician, so I was really, uh, really amazed that uh, the, the real world data could be used with the current technologies completely in a different way. So, and that's, that's something we have learned. So, uh, because this is the daily practice, what we're, uh, we're, we're collecting the data, and this could be really interpreted in a, in a very proper way. So, but at the same time, we saw uh, quite many important obstacles. And this is one is the data protection and the ethics issues, uh, because uh, it takes and it, it took time and it still takes time, for example, for us to go through all these ethical uh, uh, guidelines and things so that in our view, we, we have to think about the, some kind of new, new regulations, even on the European level, in between this crisis, just to how we should, how we can use the data as fast as possible. So because during this pandemic, we have lost actually time, we're still losing the time, and in combination, when the vaccines were not yet available, so we have lost also the life. So, that, so this is something I think that our, our researchers uh, have learned out of this uh, first attack of, of COVID. All right, I have one question for you, Jean-Marc, and I'll pass you the floor, but then I'll come to you. So if you have any, if you want to think of questions. Jean-Marc, IIT Health was, uh, you were involved in the setting up of HERA, Right, the, the authority for pandemic preparedness in Europe, because just a uh, quick reminder, but, but because um, David mentioned BARDA, that is this agency in the US that was founded, I think, after 9-11, actually, as yeah. an emergency authority to be able to unlock funds and research uh, in times of crisis. So how is HERA doing? What, what can you share? Yeah, so we started to collaborate and to cooperate with the uh, um, the beginning of uh, and the inception of um, HERA uh, authority. Um, since we were fully uh, convinced that if you always do uh, what you always did, uh, you will always get uh, uh, you always got at the end. Of which, you know, I mean, uh, it's not new. And uh, the reason, the main reason why HERA has been uh, developed so far by the member states and the European Commission was uh, evident. It was uh, a, a really a, a good. Uh, uh, pathway to uh, equip Europe uh, from a public procurement perspective to uh, uh, unlock uh, the public procurement capability uh, uh, to buy uh, innovation at scale across Europe first uh, during the war uh, crisis uh, period of time, you know, yep. uh, from uh, uh, treatments, uh, drugs, vaccines, medical technologies, uh, uh, digital health solutions, e-health, and so on and so forth. And uh, um, being able to prepare the ground from a properness perspective to uh, lessons learned from the past uh, and to prepare the medical countermeasures uh, that will, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, be considered in the, in the future. So that's why we have been uh, involved for some specific uh, uh, contributions relative to the talent gap and the talent crunch, because uh, needless to say that uh, when it comes to uh, talent um, one of the key lessons learned is not only related to the workforces uh, upskilling and reskilling of uh, workforces uh, regarding the healthcare professionals, but also uh, researchers, uh, entrepreneurs, innovators uh, within large corporate industry as well, uh, to upskilling uh, bioengineer medical bioengineers, uh, uh, bioprocessing engineers, uh, regulatory engineers, uh, and so on and so forth. So, uh, education is uh, one of the key uh, uh, contributions of EITLs within HERA. Uh, since we have been uh, selected by HERA to be part of the Joint Industrial, Industrial Cooperation Forum. Uh, the second one is about our own experience regarding the access to finance, I mean private uh, investment from uh, venture capital market. Uh, we have developed with the uh, European Investment Fund a couple of key strategic cooperation uh, programs uh, to uh, support 
uh, much more deeper uh, promising startups and SMEs, especially with regard to the spin-off which are coming from academia or research organization, uh, to bring a much more firepower for startups and SMEs. And again, it's the key question is about, obviously, bringing uh, public money, it's uh, something that we are used to, to do. But the more important, most important thing is as well to uh, leverage uh, this public funding with private investment from uh, corporate industry, but also from uh, uh, venture capital market uh, can, and institutions. Can HERA actually play a role? Yeah, HERA is currently preparing a so-called HERA Invest, which is uh, under preparations to develop further the uh, uh, private investment capability uh, uh, across Europe to bring much more firepower for promising SMEs. You know, uh, when it comes to access to finance, it's about access to subsidies. I mean, ground public funding, uh, uh, but also access to equity, so from uh, uh, capital risk, uh, capital development or capital growth, uh, uh, private investors, and venture debt. Uh, venture debt is something which is uh, really important as well, because, you know, uh, uh, when it comes to the VC market uh, uh, regulations and the VC market uh, mindset and the economic model of, of the VC market is something uh, which is really specific. Mm -hmm. Private investors are investing into prom promising biotech company. Uh, when it comes to a, a, a team, uh, robust deep technologies and uh, market uh, a, a robust business case and market access uh, uh, opportunity. Uh, and they are managing the exit. Uh, nevertheless, in Europe, uh, startup SMEs, uh, and SMEs need much more firepower, mm. uh, especially with regard to the, uh, you know, uh, uh, the uh, production capability. Uh, uh, the, 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 the many startups are looking, and, and SMEs are looking for to get much more firepower to uh, equip themselves with the. Uh, um, uh, production capability so far. So venture debt is something uh, which is really important. And uh, ERA Invest is actually trying to leverage uh, corporate industry uh, financial capability with private investors and, in, uh, let's say, public uh, and in institutional investors that are looking forward to join forces mm -hmm. and to equip the market uh, to support further promising based EU startups and SMEs. Okay, well, it's like uh, an EIC for ERA startups ah, yeah. with a mix of private and public funding. Yeah, it's complex. Different, a little bit different. So EIC fund uh, you are referring to is uh, a mix between uh, grant and uh, blended finance, so yeah. private equity uh, investment. Uh, I mean, uh, capital risk and capital uh, growth. Uh, ERA Invest will bring as well uh, venture debt capability from the European Investment Bank. It's a different story from uh, 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 financial capability. Thank you. Do you David, do you want to come? No, I ju just connect. And then I'll okay. go just, around. Please. Just connecting the dots of, of uh, HERA and, and how HERA can provide this support of um, sharing risks as well in terms of procurement. I think one of the takeaways of the lessons learned of the crisis is this anticipation of procurement capacities. Mm -hmm. Because if the industry should to produce for the future, at risk needs data. Uh, and here, I think an organization like here, here can also help to connect these dots of the data required in planning what will be the production and manufacturing needs mm. with how we financially share part of this risk of anticipating uh, the capacity. And just a, a small comment uh, adding on the relevance of dating, of uh, sh uh, sharing the data. It's not only the data, it's also, as a lesson learned uh, from the crisis, we share protocols, planning protocols at global level. So we join efforts at global level because it was a global you know, pandemic. And secondly, the access to data from the future manufacturers, you know? That means to share some data on surveillance, and here we'll for sure can play a kind of orchestrating for Europe, but also access to pathogens. There is a kind of ongoing discussion in the, uh, about uh, access to the uh, pathogen data, as if we have to protect the biodiversity of pathogens. You know, Nagoya Protocol and this kind of protecting biodiversity is to protect biodiversity. Pathogens should be killed, you know? It's that's a different sort. story. <laughs> well, that's sort, because we'll come back to, uh, to the connection between health and biodiversity. Jean-Marc, you wanted yeah, to comment? When it comes to health yeah. data, I, I mean, it's really uh, important to make it clear as well. I mean, uh, uh, at EIT Health, we are co-financing, uh, as you may know, a uh, uh, collaborative uh, public and private partnership uh, uh, project, a consortia. 
we are having uh, uh, four flagships, uh, one of which is so-called harnessing the power of uh, uh, health data for research, innovation, and public health, uh, whereby we are supporting a collaborative project uh, uh, from academ uh, in between academia, universities, and uh, large corporate industry uh, that are willing to uh, invest together in, uh, in this field. Um, it's evident that we need, obviously, to take into account our future European health data space. This is a must-have. I mean, uh, when it comes to the secondary use of, uh, use of data or the primary use of data, it's time to equip Europe with uh, uh, the famous European health data uh, space. Uh, during the pandemic crisis, it was evident that the lack of interoperability between uh, data repository from biobanks uh, or mix pharmacogenetic uh, genomics data or the digital health data, including uh, omics and so on and so forth, uh, has been a really a, a significant hurdle yeah. to support clinical trial, clinical trial outcomes at scale and uh, bolstering the uh, uh, medical evidence gen generations across across Europe. And it's still a challenging topic, is yeah. it not? Well, uh, just to continue this uh, this position, so I fully agree. So uh, what we have learned. So there is a very important is artificial intelligence to analyze the data and also the interoperability, which is also because even uh, in our country we have a lot of different uh, systems which, which takes time before you can really match those data. But this is a huge value and so that if we take the globally, globally or on European level, so even more. Mm -hmm. So that something is, uh, we have been starting already uh, to work on that direction, so just to, to make the databases which could be interoperable with others. <laughs> Thank you. We have a question, and if you have others, we'll take more. Please, and introduce yourself, please. No. No. No, yes. there it is. Yeah, you just have to keep talking. <laughs> yes, for Peterson uh, from the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. Um, as an anthropologist, I think one of the main takeaways of the pandemic is uh, the cultural aspect of health. You mentioned vaccine hesitancy. I study vaccine hostility as well as in conspiracy thinking and the false information and the information pandemic that followed the health pandemic. And I just want to uh, hear if you have any thoughts on that uh, broadening of health into SSH perspectives. So in a sense, a life science 3.0, even though that might be a bit premature if you're just introducing the 2.0. But um, I would suggest that we broaden the scope and I want to listen to your thoughts on that, please. Thank you. Uh Plenty. Well, if I may, so just Please. a very brief comment so that uh, in the previous panels there was a sustainability issue and then the research and then the science regarding those. We have just started uh, our sustainability center at the university and this is led by the social scientists. And this is, I think, that it gives a, some kind of understanding so that we highly value the importance of the social sciences, also the humanities, because all these components, because I personally think that in the future, the coming, if the next wave comes with a crisis, so the, uh, the importance of social scientists might be equally important or even more, so that how we, uh, how we give the, the messages to the society, what kind of expressions we are using, and so, so that's why I fully agree so that this is, this is our strategy. So even if we have been talking about the sustainability issues, well, um, well, more than maybe 50 years, from the early 70s already, but it was now fragmented, and, and we, have, uh, we have really uh, valuing the, the, the importance of social sciences and humanities. Ali Peter. Well, you're, you're absolutely right. We need the interdisciplinarity when it comes to handling such uh, mm -hmm. complex things as uh, health crisis. And uh, uh, at Over University, Karolinska Institute, we have established a center for health crisis, which is truly interdisciplinary. Mm -hmm. And uh, vaccine hesitancy, and coupled to uh, uh, disinformation, uh, fake news, I think we have to be as self-critical. I think academia has not paid sufficient attention to the possibilities for academia to counter 
uh, misinformation, fake news in a much more efficient way. We know that uh, a lie travels across the, the world before truth has taken the, its boots on. And uh, I think uh, there is much more we can do as academic institutions to uh, try to, to uh, correct this situation where <coughs> many of the new um, successes in medicine, not only uh, new treatments and vaccines, are met with skepticism and misinformation. I think we really need to, uh, to uh, focus much more on, on that issue. And in, uh, in Africa, for example, you know, vaccine hesitancy is one of the major obstacles. We should take that into account when we are looking at the entire value chain from education to a willing arm. Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, thanks a lot for this really uh, important and relevant question. I mean, uh, I would like to make a comment regarding uh, at least uh, three, four. Uh, the first one is about the, the current state of play, a hope and a concern. When it comes to the state of play, um, at least when it comes to EITLs and uh, many uh, uh, innovation uh, um, organizations, uh, we are considering the uh, social impact, societal impact, and patient adoptions of innovation uh, uh, when it comes to the translation from uh, research to uh, uh, applied uh, uh, solutions, treatments, or uh, services that are getting access to the market. Um, and by doing so, we used to, uh, when it comes to the evaluation of our innovation portfolio, to select um, the more relevant uh, proposal <coughs> and to finance uh, this uh, more relevant proposal. We are having a dedicated uh, uh, package of uh, selected criteria that are related to social impact, social science, patient's adoption, anthropology, and the uh, uh, unmet medical need and unmet market need, market need as well. So we are evaluating our portfolio based on these uh, social uh, science uh, from uh, the adoption perspectives. It's really crucial. Otherwise, uh, you can innovate, and uh, if it doesn't fit with the uh, uh, expectations from patients or from healthcare providers, neither the, uh, the payers at the end, the healthcare mm -hmm. system, it doesn't make sense. And it's a key question of sustainability. And the key question is about uh, health, is it about uh, uh, a cost or an investment? I have obviously uh, my own <laughs> opinion. I want to expand the question to David with uh, just to put a bit of spice on the, on the, top, on the discussion. As part of the societal acceptance, and that's linked to, to what you just said, there is also the reputation of the pharma industry. Mm -hmm. It's true. What that, that, that's can be done about it? Uh, mm. What should be done? Mm. What, what are you working on? I mean, you're delivering the public messages on behalf I of both and I, I think it's quite, quite relevant uh, to have a trust on science. You know, what, what each, each of the parties and stakeholders we are bringing our, our part in the solution of this uh, kind of global reputational aspect, because it's true it's a part of industry, but that what we have learned from the uh, crisis, the pandemic crisis, is that also there is a kind of hesitance on the trust of science. This is kind of the starting point. So we are a science-driven industry. Without the trust on science, we are also suffering part of this uh, hesitant. So I think it's super, quite relevant to build up again this connection of social trust in, in science. Mm -hmm. Also, I think what uh, it's relevant uh, and it's beyond the maybe uh, cultural aspect is also how far we are sometimes in positioning health as a kind of relevant uh, topic for the entire society. Just, just let me put an example about what is the pro pol political priority in Europe when we are trying to protect Europe. And we are thinking about chips and batteries. Uh, I think it's the moment to think about health because the pandemic crisis was the most, the highest threat of any sovereignty of Europe or any country and a, a security asset ever in the last quite long time. So I think part of the reputation is also the effort of all the stakeholders related with the biopharma and health uh, um, ecosystem to put this value of the strategic approach of health. Mm -hmm. We have a question. Go ahead. Um, 
from the European University Association. I, I work a, a bit on, quite a bit on, on foresight for universities, and one of the, let's say, risk or drivers we work with is public funding, saying you know, European countries are getting more indebted, there'll be fewer people to create value in the future. Um, <clears throat> there's, a, there's, a, there's a good likelihood that there'll be scarcity of public funding in the future. Public funding and uh, people working in the public sector. And the health sector in Europe being often very dependent on, on public funding. Is that something when you, when you talk about the holistic, the, the, the holistic approach? Um, and, and generally, is that something that's on your mind saying, okay, we want to do more, but if we want to do more, we probably have to do it with less. Or if the system is going to be able to sustain itself as it is, if there's going to be less money and maybe more money going to spend for defense, more money going to spend for, for, uh, for other things. Is that something, you know, that, that scarcity of public funding, is that something you're afraid of? Before you respond, are there any other questions? There would be, yes? Okay, then we bundle them. Thank you, Shira Menoni from Politecnico di Milano and the END now at the European Commission. Um, I have a question that is also related to a work that has been done uh, by the Scientific Advice Mechanism on Crisis Management. And the point on trust there, at a certain degree, is one of so the sub-recommendation of the uh, Chief Scientific Advisors, is related to the fact that trust uh, is a, a, a mutual aspect. Uh, so it is uh, from society to um, scientists and decision makers, uh, but it is also vice versa if you want to maintain it uh, and uh, to nurture it. So somehow in the discussion I would like to know what is your position in taking on board also local knowledge, also the um, sometimes uh, correct uh, fears uh, that uh, uh, societies uh, um, or groups uh, uh, propose uh, regarding novelty, regarding uncertainties that the scientists themselves uh, are not uh, fully able to solve. Thank you. Do we go? <coughs> well, Do you feel it, <laughs> that you have to deliver more with less? Yes, mm -hmm. so it's, uh, it's a very, it's a, first of all, it's a very interesting question. It's, uh, maybe if we take all the countries, it, it might be vary quite substantially. In our case, uh, in our country, I mean, so we uh, we haven't had in the very beginning of the of the corona, we haven't had actually a, a really good high quality advisory system for the government. So the university took the initiative. So we consisted the, the advisory body of re, uh, consisted of the university researchers. It means that we have uh, we have get a really high how to say high prestige in society as a scientist as the, the researchers, and it, it still continues. I don't know for how long. Another aspect is that even uh, we have been advising. Uh, so there is another aspect that whether uh, the researchers could be really trustable in the future. So there are some signs so that uh, if we take, for example, the vaccination rate, so, well, despite of all the measures what we have, the, well, e-solutions and everything, so that we have reached some kind of, 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 of level and it doesn't go up means that there is probably also the misunderstanding, which is, uh, if we look at the future, so I'm not very optimistic anymore, so that it might be also the fake news, fake, well, whatever the uh, understandings of, uh, um, of that. Misunderstanding from whom? Misunderstanding for, uh, in society. So what's in the, society. Yeah, in society, yeah. So that there may be some signs just, well, it's, it's not valid for the uh, health only, but it's largely, if you take all the news uh, which are surrounding us, so that it's more complicated. All right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Oli Peters and David. Yeah, I would like to pick up on the uh, funding uh, 
a question, which is, of course, a very, very relevant question. But I think we have to, to um, talk about two different dimensions here. One is the chronic funding in peacetime. Uh, the, other, the other question pertains to the funding in the acute situation. If we take the acute situation first, our experience in Sweden, uh, I think, uh, is something that we should take into consideration because I think many other countries had exactly the same uh, experience. And that is that it, when a crisis hit, of course, you need to have funding immediately. Yeah. I mean, there must be an agility to it. And uh, in Sweden, who stepped up? Well, private funding bodies. Uh, we got uh, a number of donations within days. I think uh, the um, public funding bodies have to step up to the challenge next time around so that uh, resources can be released more or less immediately. Because what happened today or this time around was, as we all know, the virus got a head start. Next time around, the head start mm -hmm. must be shortened dramatically. So agility when it comes to funding is essential. So I think the public uh, funding bodies have to look into their um, uh, ability to respond quickly. So, and then it's the chronic funding. Mm -hmm. And uh, EUA, I think you have had uh, quite a lot of uh, valuable uh, um, uh, sort of considerations when it comes to this. An interesting thought would be to compare the costs of the global lockdown, so to speak, during the pandemic with the costs of funding science. I think if you do this uh, sort of equation, you will easily see that there must be room for continued funding of science, not least by basic science. I think the pandemic was simply a tribute to, to long-time basic funding. And I think, again, to be a bit self-critical, we, we, have, we haven't really managed to, to communicate this. Because very often in the newspapers, you, you see that vaccines were developed at warp speed, mm -hmm. just as if mm -hmm. it all boiled down to research over the past two years. Yeah. But in real life, I mean, we are talking about the effect of decades of research. You can just look at the list of Nobel Prizes in physiology and medicine, and you will see why we were much better equipped to handle this pandemic than the Spanish flu. So uh, I, I think uh, we have to communicate successes in a much better way to really bring to the table the fantastic success of basic science that we have witnessed during this pandemic. Excellent. Uh, yeah. just, just to add about this financing, so that of course the public money and then the, the, the different other types of support were really substantial and they were quite quick, so yeah, very, very good timing so that there is no problem, but the healthcare systems uh, have different capacities. If we take the country, the rise, and we are still facing the consequences of the, of the pandemic, so there is a, 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 a shortage of, of both doctors, nurses, so they are tired, and uh, there are excess mortality, which, which gives you an understanding there is a whole healthcare system is, is somehow Long waiting affected. list of So patients. it takes time, so, and it comes also to the, uh, the, 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 the financing. Yeah, so in the long run. Yeah. Okay, that comes back to the question of talents that we spoke yeah, about yeah. before. The David. Yeah, just start, um, the gentleman asked about threats, you know, yeah. if we were worried about. Well, in the, lo in the short term, I think there is a common threat. We are under, under a poly crisis with an inflation pressure, with an economic for, uh, forecast that is not very positive. I think I, here in this uh, panel, we will quite be aligned that it's not the time to be frugal with health after the pandemic. This is my first reaction. The second is about, okay, if just we compare some figures in Europe, if we compare with the US, if we are just uh, providing to the world 22% of our in the, of treatments, while half of the new treatments are provided by US, mm. but when we say that um, we, in 2020, we absorbed 20% of the clinical trials, and now we are attracting only 6%. That means that we need a common effort of funding, public and private, if we want to be competitive. And here, just my reaction, more, 
not only to, uh, to the volume, it's how we invest, that maybe it's also uh, part of your proposal. Look, what it seems quite clear is that when US was uh, investing 13 billion in developing clinical knowledge of COVID-19, mm -hmm. while Europe was not there, we should be prepared that this will not happen in the future for the next pandemic, and this is part of the uh, idea of this panel. So that requires being sustainable in the investment because we need the money in the immediate crisis when you have been investing for a long. You should be targeted in what you want to be invested. And here we need the collaboration of the public sector and the private sector to mm. identify the priorities to target the investment. And finally, then we can be intensive in that targeted long-term investment. But that required a kind of collaboration again of the public and the private sector. So unlike what we heard earlier today, uh, in, in such cases uh, of pandemics actually or crisis, the funding cycles must, must be much shorter, right? This is actually what is needed, uh, yeah. more agile funding cycles. Jean-Marc. Yeah, um, uh, to reply to your question, uh, can we do more with less? No, no. <laughs> definitively no. I mean, uh, I invite you to read the report from Jacques Delors Institute, uh, which is so-called uh, Sustainable Future of Health. And uh, again, coming back to my previous comment, uh, health should not have to be considered as a cost, mm -hmm. but as an investment. When it comes to the impact on the economic uh, society, uh, the uh, pandemic uh, key lessons learned is the demonstration of the fact that if you are investing in health, basic research and innovation, you are uh, obviously uh, managing quite, quite well the uh, impact on the social, societal impact and the economic uh, impact as well, uh, from an uh, uh, economic growth perspective as well, you know. Uh, now, when it comes to the different type of, of funding, I mean, uh, different type of, uh, let's say, money, yeah. public funding, usually it's quite difficult to mobilize quite fast public funding from an agility perspective or flexibility perspective. I mean, because obviously, since it's about tax money, you have to get, first of all, approval from member states and from the European Commission to mobilize a huge amount of public money. Uh, private money is much more agile uh, when it comes to decision-making process to mobilize uh, private uh, money so far. So it's a mix in, in between, uh, let's say, uh, short-term uh, financial capability that you can mobilize from private sector and uh, mid-term financial capability that you can, uh, can mobilize uh, from member states and from the European Commission so far. And maybe the era, again, I we're coming back to HERA, is one of the more uh, relevant decisions that the European Commission has made over the last uh, couple of years mm -hmm. to equip Europe with the uh, ability and capability to uh, fight against uh, war uh, period of time and uh, preparedness period of time. So we are currently not really in a peace period, but we have to prepare the ground uh, to invest a lot uh, to prepare our future uh, when it comes to the sustainability of health. Mm -hmm. Good. We are entering the final uh, six minutes of this session, and uh, one question I have is about the global efforts uh, to prepare for, for future pandemics. Uh, the WHO has been given the, the mandate to uh, work on an international treaty for pandemic preparedness. Uh, it all started very well. Uh, there, there is uh, clearly a global will to, uh, to find a mechanism, legally binding, I should say, mm -hmm. mechanism uh, for, uh, for, uh, to set up a, this, this international umbrella system. What would you recommend? What needs to happen at the global level? You talked about competitiveness, right? So that doesn't go in that direction. So are we talking governance only, data sharing? What, what is it? I have a strong opinion when it comes to uh, global, uh, global health and global competition. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. let's make clear that we don't have to be naive. I mean, uh, we are competing with US and China, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. full stop. It doesn't mean that we don't have to, to, to take care about uh, uh, inequity countries that are not getting access to treatments and vaccines and uh, technologies. It's our responsibility from a social perspective to make sure that we can support all the countries so far. But it's a competition. And uh, uh, that's why from an EU sovereignty, sovereignty perspective, um, uh, government, member states and European Commission uh, must develop further 
uh, me uh, specific mechanisms to uh, uh, protect EU uh, countries from basic uh, research to uh, uh, market access of uh, relevant innovations in the healthcare domain. The IPCA in health is one of the response. I mean, the important, co uh, you, you, you were referring to the battery mm -hmm. or chips. Uh, mm -hmm. The IPCI, important yeah, so the IPCI is an European important project interest. of common European interest in health is one of the concrete response. Yeah. Obviously, you have to demonstrate that there is a, a specific market failure. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, uh, this mechanism is not uh, supported by the European Commission. I do believe that this is the way to move forward. And when it comes to global, uh, global health, I mean, um, the IP matter is something which is very important as well, making sure that we can equip mm -hmm. and provide and gathering uh, treatments, vaccines to uh, um, um, other countries that, uh, that, that are not getting access to uh, uh, these uh, technologies at cost. But I mean, uh, from a societal uh, perspective debate, um, as a citizen, I'm shocked when I'm listening to people that are saying, industry should have to uh, leave the IP uh, or the patent of vaccines uh, to the public uh, bodies. It doesn't make sense. I mean, it's, about, uh, it's a market, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, uh, governance. Um, in fact, we will have a meeting uh, at Karolinsk Institute now uh, this week on, on Thursday on this very issue. How to look at the governance systems when we now that uh, this time around, at least the global governance system did not work mm -hmm. uh, to uh, ensure that we uh, provided the fruit of science on an equitable basis to the entire world. I, I think we have to look into the current uh, governance uh, systems. And there is a fantastic opportunity now to do this. Uh, on the 30th, uh, 30th of November, as you know, uh, the EU came, uh, published its uh, new global health strategy. Yeah. And uh, in this strategy, there are clear indications <clears throat> that uh, we need to look at uh, the governance uh, system, not only uh, on the global level, but uh, also when it comes to the EU level. So I think there is a need to, to look at the entire governance system with convergence on health, to see how the different uh, governance structures in the EU can uh, communicate much in much more efficient manner with a focus on uh, the health challenges that we are seeing. I mean, uh, go, going back in history, it's quite clear EU was formed when uh, the challenges were a completely different nature, started out with the coal and steel community trade economy. Now we see an entirely different uh, plethora of challenges. Not only there is a risk for a new pandemic, but there are parallel crises mm -hmm. coming up. Yeah. Uh, biodiversity, pollution was mentioned, energy crisis, and all of these uh, crises, they have a health aspect to it. So I think that we have to look at the governance system to see how we can put center more, uh, health more in focus. Uh, and this is true for the uh, global level, and, but also at uh, EU level. This is a discussion we're going to have on Thursday. Very good. Uh, just coming back to one point that you raised, David, about the, the need to look at, to, to have this multidisciplinary uh, lens and to look at health. I mean, you just mentioned the poly crisis or this mm. parallel crisis. Mm. There's also the, this bridge those that are needed uh, between health and biodiversity. So when, we, when it comes to global governance, you mentioned pathogens yes. uh, earlier. Do you think a protocol like the Nagoya Protocol mm -hmm. is still fit for purpose or is it completely counterproductive? Well, I think it, it, if it's not understood correctly, what is the main goal of this to, Nagoya? You, maybe you need to remind what the Nagoya uh, Protocol is. Uh, it, 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 it makes sense to protect biodiversity and also to protect, you know, um, the countries that can provide this um, information for the rest of the world and also to incentivize just to share this data. But the, the, the diversity, the biodiversity should be protected. Pathogens should not. So uh, the sooner the better to share any information with no hurdle about any pathogen. And when we are thinking about what will be, for example, the role of this accord or this uh, potential e e tool from WHO in the future, one of the aspects that should be protected is this access to these data as soon as possible. Because this is, this is on a, a topic that concerns not only the industry that will be able to provide the solution, 
but especially the scientific uh, community. So it's a, it's a joint effort to uh, educate all the organizations that this sharing data is absolutely relevant. Very good. Thomas, do, did you have any final word? Well, I have just to agree with what Ole Petri has said and uh, fully, yes. Well, that's a perfect way to end, well, if everybody you. agrees. Thomas, you also agree? Yeah, I agree, but global <laughs> health is not only about human health. I mean, it's about as well animal health. Yes. Yes. And, um, uh, I do believe that we have to take care about uh, animal health right, as well, very important especially point, with actually. regard to the uh, um, antimicrobial resistance. Mm -hmm. It is uh, really a specific uh, potential future crisis. All right, well, that's going to be uh, the topic of a future panel. Please, round of applause. It is time for lunch, so gentlemen, thank, thank you, you very much. much. Thank you. Thank You've been you. very brave. Super.